Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today, as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside, we are in the concluding section of chapter 7 with quadrilaterals and other polygons, I believe is the actual name of the chapter. This section is on properties of trapezoids and kites. We started off with all of the different kinds of polygons and went straight to parallelograms of the types of quadrilaterals. Last section was on rectangles, rhombuses, and squares. I did one of those Are You Ready reviews, and now we're back into the actual textbook, Big Ideas Math, if you want to print out or look at, open up a PDF of this down below, which I'm going to play here and do the lecture, and an over overview of all the problems on. Please click on that and take a look at any of the timestamps that you need to follow along. But like I said, trapezoids and kites is the way here. I don't know if they're going to go into the rectangles, rhombuses, squares, parallelogram stuff. I imagine this one's just trapezoids and kites, so we'll see. Probably things with graphs, and um, yeah, and then we'll do the review portion that does all the stuff, the one out of the textbook, and then the chapter test and cumulative assessment, and then we move on to chapter eight, whenever that one will be available for you. So without further ado, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have moving here. We're going to use properties of trapezoids and properties of kites. And using properties of trapezoids, we'll use the trapezoid mid-segment theorem to find distances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not the same one as triangles, necessarily. And identify quadrilaterals. That doesn't sound like it's something straight out of kites. That sounds like for all the different types. So we may be doing things with not just trapezoids and kites, but also parallelograms, rectangles, rhombuses, and squares. Identify based on the properties that they give us or the kind of shape that we have. So it's kind of a review all within, I imagine. Core vocab, besides trapezoid and kite, we will have bases and base angles. That's gonna be used in trapezoids. Legs is also used in trapezoids. Isosceles trapezoid, mid-segment of a trapezoid. Kite is really its own thing. And there's an old video I have somewhere. Um, it's like a 10 minute thing. I think if you, it's it's either called special quadrilaterals or quadrilaterals and the properties or something like that. It's, I thought I thought I was being really funny in my video when I made it. I was really monotonous and suddenly moved myself. I was being really monotonous. I was, uh, I inserted little images and clips and things like that within. And I talked about how you can identify different types of uh, quadrilaterals. I don't really bring up kites. I bring up kite for like half a second at the very end of it. It's, it's funny. Kite, kites are just a different breed, um, but you can do a lot with kites as well, especially their diagonals. Okay, using properties of trapezoids. A trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides. Those parallel sides are also known as bases. So the ones I'm pointing to up and down right here are the bases, unlike a parallelogram, which is two pairs of parallel sides specifically. A trapezoid is not a parallelogram. They never are. There are websites and textbooks and things like that that will claim that these are also um, parallelograms, also trapezoid. We like to keep them uniquely different for the most part, and that's what we're going to do here. Base angles of a trapezoid are two consecutive angles whose common side is a base. So here's a pair of base angles, and then here's a pair of base angles, angles from a single base each. They're not necessarily congruent or anything like that, unless it's a certain kind of trapezoid. Uh, a trapezoid is two pairs of base angles. So A and D are base angles, B and C are base angles, the second pair. The non-parallel sides are the legs of the trapezoid. So here's a leg and there is a leg. So in triangles, we've seen legs in isosceles triangles and in right triangles, but now trapezoids also have legs. If the legs of a trapezoid are congruent, then the trapezoid is an isosceles trapezoid. So now these two are congruent. The uh, pair of parallel sides shouldn't really ever be congruent because then that would be a parallelogram, right? We know that thing that if this pair is congruent and parallel, it's parallelogram. So that's not going to be true, but these ones can be. Uh, they didn't mention it yet here. I'm sure they will at some point. The base angles are then congruent in this kind of thing. Diagonals are also congruent. Like I said, I'm sure they're going to bring that stuff up, but just in case they don't, I want to point that out right now. All right, let's see what we're going to do. Stuff with graphs, identifying a trapezoid in the coordinate plane. Show that ORST is a trapezoid, then decide whether it is isosceles. They're doing two different things. They do go by the slopes of RS and OT. I think it helps by looking at the diagram to see which ones you want to likely compare. Clearly, RO and ST are not parallel. But RO, excuse me, RS and OT are. Um, I think it's important to also show that these are not parallel, though, at the same time. So, you know, what have you. They're not parallel, because if they were, it'd be a parallelogram. 
And then we also want to see whether it is isosceles or not. We have to see if these have the same length as well. And by the way, I'm they, they're doing their slopes this way. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. I would just do a rise over run. Up 1 over 2. This is up 2 over 4, which is also 1 half. So parallel. Vertical line versus non-vertical line, not parallel. Um, this is a count of 1, 2, 3. And by distance formula here, this will be, it looks like, 2 root 2. So, yeah, 2 root 2 versus 3. Different lengths there. Therefore, these are not uh, congruent. So it's not an isosceles trapezoid. Uh, let's move forward and see what else. Okay, so the things I just mentioned that I, I should have left for them to say. Uh, things that either we're going to have to prove or they'll prove for us. Base angles. Each pair of base angles are congruent and an isosceles trapezoid, as you can see there. Um, the base angle is converse. I don't know if I've ever had a need to know this before, but it's now time for me to learn it. If a trapezoid has a pair of congruent base angles, it's an isosceles trapezoid. Okay, I, I guess I knew that. That makes sense. These two would therefore have to be... Um, there's. We're going to have to prove it later. <laughs> Uh, same side interior angle stuff, da 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 da. So anyway, this trapezoid is isosceles just by knowing the pair of base angles is congruent in the trapezoid. And then the diagonals theorem: the diagonals are congruent in an isosceles trapezoid as well. Now it shows if and only if, which means this is by conditional. If it's an isosceles trapezoid, diagonals are congruent. If diagonals are congruent in a trapezoid, then it is isosceles. It goes both ways. All right, so let's look at the properties of isosceles trapezoids and see what we want to say here. The stone above the arch in the diagram is an isosceles trapezoid. Find measure of angle K, M, and J. So boom, boom, boom. Those three. An isosceles trapezoid would show these would both be 85, and these would be the supplements of them. And I think that's important to mention. You know, I, I mentioned it once for same side interior angles, same with parallelograms. K and J are going to be supplementary to each other. You can do the whole... They add to 360, but you don't need to. These will add to 180, and these will add to 180. So these will each be 95, J and M, will each be 95 degrees, whereas K will be 85 degrees, stuff that they point out here. I'm, I'll let you read that if you'd like to. But those are supplementary in the same way they are in a parallelogram. I don't know how they say it. Um, consecutive interior angles form. It's non consecutive non-base angles. I guess is a way to say there's there's something else I'm sure that I could say I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, is this isosceles? Sure, if the if the diagonals are congruent, yeah, we'll obviously do some more together. Using the mid segment theorem, okay, so we know of a mid segment in a triangle is a segment that joins two midpoints of a triangle. This is also true of a trapezoid. However, here they're referring to the legs midpoints connecting by a mid segment. Now the mid segment, there's a theorem within a mid segment and how can, how you can find its length knowing some other lengths. As a mid segment does break this up into two similar kinds of trapezoids, the mid segment is the average. It's the average of your two base lengths, A, B, and C, D. Add them up and divide by two. They say one half of this plus this. Sure. Um, if you've done, I don't think we're doing area. If, you didn't, if you've done area of a trapezoid, one half B1 plus B2 times height, you're averaging your two base lengths and that kind of works out a rectangle in the form. Anyway, so um, you average your two base lengths here and then you can get the mid-segment length. They're all parallel. And uh, yeah, it creates this similarity. Similarity is something else we're actually gonna talk about in uh, chapter eight. And I don't know if that's gonna be used in figures outside of triangles really. So basically they grow, they grow in proportion of each other. This one can expand to grow to twice as big in that way and all this. Okay, um, all right, so they're gonna find this mid-segment length. They average 12 and 28, add them up to 40, divided by two, you get 20. There's the length. Um, you can find the lengths of, without knowing where Y and Z are specifically as points, even though you could find midpoints, that's very much something you could do and do the distance. You could also find the length of these two using distance formulas Add them up and divide by 2. Looks like they get their lengths of 2 root 5 and 4 root 5. Add them up to get 6 root 5. Half of that is 3 root 5. Like I said, you could probably do midpoints of these two based on the points that we have there. Okay, uh, let's move forward. Do we get kites? Yes, a kite. So, a kite um, is not a rhombus. So, a kite doesn't have any parallel sides. 
I'll let them say that somewhere. That's that's my understanding of, once again, we separate kites from parallelograms because I don't want you to confuse it with a rhombus. Now that I know where the tool is, <laughs> where's the tool? Now that I know where the tool is here, this rhombus, for example, this is not a kite. Um, it's not just diamond. Uh, even though generally they're drawn in that way to have the diagonals be horizontal and vertical. But a kite has two pairs of consecutive congruent sides. Oh, yes, opposite sides are not congruent, yes. So these two sets are congruent. These two sets are congruent. And then they're not congruent to each other here or here. Therefore, it's never a parallelogram. So rhombus being a parallelogram has all sides congruent, which means pairs of consecutive sides are congruent. But a rhombus is not a kite. So I want to differentiate between one and the other. The diagonals theorem, a kite has diagonals that are perpendicular to each other. Um, they are not mentioning yet, although I'm sure that they will, that one diagonal does bisect the other, but the diagonals are indeed perpendicular to each other. That's why I said they tend to draw them this way with the diagonals. Um, I'm sure they're going to bring it up, but BD is bisecting AC as well, but AC does not bisect BD. So they don't bisect each other. One is a perpendicular bisector of the other. All right. Uh, if it's a kite, then the diagonals are perpendicular, but the converse isn't necessarily true. Uh, opposite angles theorem, there's one pair of opposite angles that are congruent. Again, all this stuff can be proved. I'm sure we're going to prove that stuff at some point using congruent triangles. That's a pretty straightforward proof, actually, using side, side, side. Um, so, yeah, these, these two are congruent. These two are not congruent for the same kind of way that we're talking about how the opposite sides aren't congruent. So kites are very special in the things that they have. Uh, the diagonals here, BC is congruent to BA. Okay. Uh, oh, they're proving something. They're proving the diagonals are congruent. I'm going to I'm gonna leave the proof be. Um, we're going to be able to look at some together eventually. Um, okay. I kind of feel like I need to move myself here, but maybe not. Here we go. Finding a measure of angle D in the kite shown. So this kite has 115 and 73 degree angles of the two non-congruent angles. Knowing it's a kite, Either they tell you that, or you can see by the congruent parts marked here. Boom and boom. D and F got to be congruent to each other, and in total, this all adds to 360. So 175 plus 73 plus these two measures of angles are 360. They substitute for one to make one the same. They might as well call them just X each. And so they solve for one individual one. If D is 86 degrees, then so is F. They just said find measure of angle D, though, so they're both the same. They're both 86 degrees if you do the algebra with it. Identifying spe special quadrilaterals. So here is a nice breakdown. And I know I did it somewhat of a drawing in one of the sections, probably 7-4. I don't think I brought up the kites in trapezoids. And generally, I do them in the opposite way. But quadrilaterals can take on any form as long as it's a four-sided shape, right? Anything, anything. Um, you can see something where nothing's parallel, but not necessarily a kite. Parallelogram looking. Rectangle is a parallelogram. Square is a parallelogram. Rhombus is a parallelogram. All these things fall within parallelogram which can turn to rectangle rhombus or square as a result of what you got. But you can have one pair of parallel sides, which is then identified as a trapezoid. And more specifically, you can make the trapezoid isosceles. And then kite is its own thing, nothing parallel. However, the two sets of consecutive sides are congruent with each other. So those are the different names of trapezoids that we're aware of, excuse me, quadrilaterals that we're aware of. Um, and then they're just generic quadrilaterals, which can just be anything. Not any of these names, but it's just a quadrilateral. Maybe nothing is um, special about it. So let's identify some quadrilaterals based on what we have here. Let's see how good we are at this. What is the most specific name for quadrilateral ABCD? So before I answer that, let's, you know, square, if square was the answer, then we won't say rectangle, rhombus, parallelogram, or quadrilateral, for example. If the answer is just rectangle and we can't guarantee it's a square, then we won't say that. Okay, what's the most specific name for this quadrilateral? I only see diagonals bisect each other. That's something that we know of parallelograms. So I'm going to call this a parallelogram only. Um, I just <laughs> cracked my water open on, on myself. Um, yes, parallelogram. These are also parallelograms, but there's not enough information to say whether they are any of those ones. No right angles, no sets of congruent sides, perpendicular diagonals, um, diagonals bisecting angles, anything like that. Okay, um, as at least one pair of opposite sides congruent, what types of quadrilaterals meet this condition? It says at least one pair. Now, that, that's a different kind of way to ask that, and if they ask me later, I'm going to be back and forth because, like, isosceles trapezoids have it, 
but then so do parallelograms, and then therefore, by extension, so do rectangles, rhombuses, and squares. Um, but I don't know if that they mean that I must name it that versus I can name it that, so I don't know. Anyway, I'll let this thing move forward as we uh, get started. Vocabulary and core concept check numbers one and two. That's the end of the lecture. Let's move on to answering questions. Describe the differences between a trapezoid and a kite. So a trapezoid has one pair of parallel sides, whereas a kite doesn't have any. Um, there are a lot of different other things though. Kites have, like I'm not gonna list everything, but kites have uh, two sets of consecutive parallel sides. and uh, perpendicular diagonals. I mean, there are other things, right? Trapezoids, you name things with bases and legs and diagonals can be congruent. Oh, well, I guess kites, they can be congruent too. Um, you just gotta make it the same way. Anyway, just, yeah, different things like that. All right, which is different? Find both answers here. Let's see, is there enough information to prove trapezoid A, B, C, D is isosceles is the question. Now, the answer is Yes, there is, uh, but that's one option A. Is there enough information to prove that AB is congruent to DC? AB congruent to DC is not something that we'd be looking for. That's something in a parallelogram. That looks like a different kind of question entirely. AD and BC, yep. Yeah. That, no. Is there enough information to prove the non-parallel sides of trapezoid ABC are congruent? So these ones, AD and BC, yes, based on the same kind of question as A. They're saying the same thing, calling isosceles. Is there enough information to prove the legs of trapezoid A, B, C, D are congruent? So once again, these are the legs. Same kind of question asking there. And the answer to those is yes, there is enough information. B, there's enough information to prove that this is not true. Um, that's not true. Because <laughs> uh, we can't guarantee that this is absolutely a trapezoid. This could be, this for, for all we know, this could be, uh, these could be 90 degree angles, you know, this could be a rectangle. We don't, we don't know. So is there enough information for B? No. Is there enough for this A stuff? Yes. And they're talking about isosceles trapezoids, and those are the same kind of question. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and move forward to numbers three through, I think, 52. So get your hats on, whatever, thinking caps. Let's, let's go to war. Let's start looking at these kinds of questions. Let me get set up. Da, 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 da. I need my black ink right there. I need to see myself with the questions. All right, number three. It's not that I need to see myself. I need to see that I can see the problems because sometimes I write down here and it's like, oh, you didn't see that and I need to know. All right, numbers three through six. Show that a qu the quadrilateral with the ver uh, given vertices is a trapezoid, then decide whether it is isosceles. So we're going straight to graphs. So I'm going to copy and paste right now. Um, I'm going to go kind of a shorter method with these whenever I come up with the uh, distances. I use the slopes and such and count them and Pythagorean theorem. I don't use distance formula, so to speak. So W is at 1, 4. Uh, X is at 1, 8. Easy enough to be able to see those. W and X. Y is at negative 3, 9. And Z. Z is at negative three, three. I can tell you everything about it right now based on based on slopes, right? Um, this is going to be, a, this is a good first problem to start off with. We don't generally see trapezoids parallel. Uh, excuse me, we generally don't see the bases go vertical like this. Uh, what was the first one? Show that it's a trapezoid. So the slope of segment ZY is undefined right you're dividing by zero it's all rise no run but the same as the slope of x w or w x or whatever it's also undefined so those have matching slopes um why x and z w do not have matching slopes they have opposite slopes not reciprocals but opposite so this is up one over four and this is down one and over four so the slope of x y is negative one fourth. Let me do that in green. And then the slope of WZ is positive one fourth. So different slopes. Um, 
I don't want to just check it. I want to X it, but in a good way. The slopes are different, which makes it not a parallelogram. We know it's a trapezoid with a set of parallel slopes and then a set of non-parallel slopes. The other part that's important here is that XY and ZW have the same length. Now, I didn't say what it is yet. I can, I can tell you it's root 17. But the fact that they have the exact same run, change in X and change in Y, positive or negative, means they will have the same hypotenuse if you consider these to be right triangles. So, um, yeah, let's go to that. That would be like, a, if I call this thing C, I could say 4 squared plus 1 squared equals C squared. 16 plus 1. So square root of 17. So x, y equals z, w, which is the square root of 17. I think for the most part, guys, I'm going to avoid really doing too much Pythagorean theorem work. I want to kind of just show that they're the same. So this is not only a trapezoid, it's an isosceles trapezoid. Now, not all of these are guaranteed to be isosceles trapezoids, right? So trapezoid. I wanted to make sure already that I can still see what I'm writing. All right, there's number three. One question... 49 more to go. Number four. This this could be a long one. All right. That's why, like I said, I want to do as much as little work. See, it's a solution guide video. You don't have to copy what I do. I'm just going to explain how something will work. You want to use distance formula. You're required to use it. There are some teachers in my department who require it. And that's not a knock on them at all. They, if, if they want to require it, they can require it. It's good practice. Um, I'm just saying for my sake of time, I ain't going to do it. And so it's it's up to you to really, uh, oops, negative three zero. It's up to you to decide how you're told to do something with that in mind. Okay, uh, this here definitely doesn't look like an isosceles trapezoid, but it could still be a trapezoid. Maybe not the conventional type. And you know what? We don't often think of trapezoids in the way of having anything be, oh, what's the word? Well, yeah, like this, you know, you know, normally you see trapezoids like this, right? They, they stick out, but we never think of one going a little more inward. So this one's kind of doing something more like this. Does that make it not a trapezoid because it goes out? No, of course it's still a trapezoid, one pair of parallel sides. So as long as you have that, which is what we're going to look into. D, E, F, and G. Let's see. Clearly, D, G, the, the slope, listen, I'm, I'm just going to go straight into it. The slope of D, G, if it's, if it's visible based off of one vertical and one not, I'm going to call it like it is this time. It's not equal to the slope of E, F. However, these slopes have over 2, down 2, down 4, over 4. So the slopes of segments uh, DE and GF are the same. Negative 4 over 4, negative 2 over 2, that's negative 1. So trapezoid. Isosceles. No. If there's if there's something else to know, it's that base angles would have been congruent. This would have been congruent to that. Clearly not the case. One's very obtuse, one's very acute, and um, not the same distances here either. This length is 2 root 2, this length is 4 root 2. So I can write it. GF is 4 root 2. This is Pythagorean theorem stuff. Again, look into that if you'd like to use that. 2 root 2, so not the same. So trapezoid. If I just say trapezoid, I mean not isosceles. So just saying show it's a trapezoid, yes. Uh, is it isosceles? No. All right, number five. 48 problems to go. I think after this, they probably go a little faster. But, you know, not a lot of things here are about solving for x. You know, like the parallelogram stuff everywhere, bisecting angles and congruent opposite or sorry bisecting diagonals congruent opposite angles and you know stuff like that it's just opposite sides are congruent a lot of stuff in solving for x there which made it really straightforward to do uh, eight zero 
once again, looks like a trapezoid non-isosceles here. M, N, P, Q. So we got a couple slopes of zero with these horizontal lines, probably the more conventional way you'd think of a trapezoid. Non-isosceles because of the lengths that we're going to see here as well. Uh, the slope of NP is zero. The slope of segment MQ. MQ, let me do that again. Slope of segment, oh my gosh. Slope of segment MQ is zero. So those are the same. Uh, these slopes are different, and they're also going to make different lengths, therefore non-isosceles as well. This is up 4 over 2. This is over 4, down 4, or whichever way you want to put it. Um, different slopes. Different slopes, right? So slope of MN is not the same as the slope of PQ. Okay, um, And MN does not equal PQ. Okay, This would have been 16 plus 20. Uh, excuse me, 16 plus 4, which is 20, so 2 root 5. 2 root 5, this would have been 4 root 2. Not the same. So just trapezoid, non isosceles. Now, is it enough for you guys to be able to just look at it and say, I know? Probably not. You can get an inkling of your answer based on that. You're. Your, your teachers, your tests and stuff are going to want to see numbers. So I'm giving numbers. You can you can come up with those. But as I said, 46 problems to go or something like that, right? Um, or 47. Number six. All right, H is at 1, 9. K is at 4, 2. Sorry, J is at 4, 2. K is at 5, 2. Ooh. And L is at 8, 9. I imagine this should be isosceles again. H, J, K, L. Different looking trapezoid, but trapezoid nonetheless. We still, once again, have horizontal lines. Horizontal lines are always parallel with each other. So slope of H, L is 0. The slope of segment J, K is 0. These slopes are opposites again, I believe. Let's see that. From 9 to 2 is 7, so down 7 and right 3. And this is over 3 and up 7. So the slopes are opposite of each other, which again, by Pythagorean theorem standard, 7 squared 49, 3 squared 9. That's the square root of 58 you'll see here. And the square root of 58 you'll see here. So different slopes, the slope of segment H j is not the same as the slope of segment kl however hj is congruent or is equal to kl in length because they both share lengths of square root of 58 therefore boo 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 therefore isosceles trapezoid once again we meet again isosceles trapezoid so you may distance formula that all you'd like um, I'm done. In exercises 7 and 8, find the measure of each angle in the isosceles trapezoid. So in isosceles trapezoids, we, uh, number 7, I'm trying to decide how much I want to uh, draw things out versus my general copy and paste method. I think after doing one of these copy and paste, you'll see me probably not copy and paste anymore. But I like to bring it up. Uh, so number 7, what do they want? Uh, oh, of each angle. All right, so isosceles trapezoid, these are the congruent or parallel bases, I should say. So these two angles here are congruent with each other, and these two will be congruent with each other. Those are base angles. So measure of angle J is going to be the same as measure of angle K, which is 118 degrees. Now, each of M and L will be the same. They will be supplementary to those other sets of base angles, though. So measure of angle L, for example... It's going to be 180 minus 118. Oh, let me just say that for both of them. Measure of angle L is the same as measure of angle M, which is 180 minus 118, as they would add to 180 in that way. So that's 62 degrees. So 62 and 118 are the sets of angles that you have there for that. Yeah, I feel like uh, I'm not going to be copying and pasting anymore. You can see it on this other side of this page as we work these out. All right, number eight. 
Now, like, uh, isosceles trapezoid here, once again. Now, they tell you it's an isosceles trapezoid, which is uh, important. So, 82 degrees. So, measure of angle R is also going to be 82 degrees. Maybe we can mark up the diagram, though. So, these are going to be congruent. These will be congruent in their own right and supplementary to those. So, measure of angle Q and T. Measure of angle Q equals measure of angle T which is going to be 180 minus 82, which is 98 degrees. All right. Numbers 9 and 10, find the length of the mid-segment of the trapezoid. Okay, so a mid-segment, once more from the lecture that we saw before, you average the lengths of your bases. We're going to average 18 and 10, also in some ways known as a midpoint. So this answer is going to be 14. Let's take a look. MN. Mn, if I did the straight up formula, half of 18 plus 10, which is half of 28, which is 14 units in length. That's how mid segments roll for trapezoids. Number 10, same ish. Looks like we'll have a decimal value this time. Mn, nn, mn. The length of mn is half of. 57 plus 76, which is half of, oh, 133, which is 66.5. You sure of that? Nine and a half away? Nine, yeah, yeah, that'll work. Okay. See, I like quick questions like that. Let's find the length of AB now in numbers 11 and 12. Now, they give you enough information to see what you can make a conclusion on. This is a mid-segment, MN, just like you saw before. It is a mid-segment because of the congruent parts here means midpoint and midpoint, and it's mid-segment of a trapezoid, given the parallel sides. But we know the mid-segment this time. So, you know, a couple different ways you can do this. Um, I can tell you right now the answer is going to be four. It's, um, you know, if you want to go from the formula here, seven is the average, this time, of ten and some other number that is the length of segment AB. That's kind of another way you can think about it. I won't distribute the one half. Instead, let's multiply both sides by two. So 14 is 10 plus AB and subtracts 10 from both sides. AB is four. If there's a faster way to do it, I, I kind of mentioned that MN's length is kind of like the midpoint of the two numbers. So if seven is three away, you know, minus three from 10, this is going to be another three away from that one, right? That's just kind of how that thing works. That's how midpoints and averages of two numbers work. And I, you know, there's no two ways around it. Maybe this one's not as easy to tell what you're adding this time. You are adding, if we want to kind of do it more conventional way, you're adding 7.2. So let's add another 7.2 here. And I'm venturing a guess that we're, that's a seven. I'm venturing a guess here that we're going to get the number 25.9. But let's do it the other way just to see what we do get. So 18.7 is the average. Taking half of 11.5 and this length of AB, this unknown length of AB. Let's double this and get 37.4. And then subtract 11.5 and that's 36.9 and 25.9. Yep, AB is 25.9 units in length oh that was number 12 i do apologize there but i'm going to go ahead and set up number 13 while you see that i selected number 12 so let's go ahead and oh not paste that let's paste an old graph okay number 13. in 13 and 14 find the length of the mid segment of the trapezoid with the given vertices so two questions on these so we're going to have a at 2, 0, B at 8, negative 4, C at 12, 2, so that does go off the map a little bit, we'll deal, and D at 0, 10. Do they call this any kind of trapezoid? No, we just got to find the mid segments with these. So, you have options, and I, I mentioned them before, I, they might have only done one example with these, and if you recall what they did was they found the lengths, I mean, look, we can tell which ones are supposed to be the parallel ones for this trapezoid, right? These two here, I think having the graph helps you there. So the mid segment would be somewhere 
ideally would be somewhere like this. I don't know if that's exact or not, whatever. It looks like it's probably close enough, if not exact. Um, in fact, yes, that's that's probably exactly what it is right there. So that's the mid segment. But even if you didn't know what the, see, you could either find the midpoints and then find its length, which is very valid. I'll probably do both methods. Or you can find the lengths of these individually, A, B, and C, D, and then average their lengths. Add them up and divide by two. So let's do one version here. Let's, uh, let's turn this to a different color like that. All right, let's use green and trace along the length of A, B, and C, D. Find their distances and average them in that way. D goes from 0 to 12, and then from 10 down to 2. Right, 10 to 2, yeah. So 12 squared plus 8 squared. 144 plus 64. See, this is probably the longer method this time. So 208. So the square root of 208. Um, oh. Does 16, 16 goes into that, huh? 10, 11, 12, 13. So 4 root 13, I believe. We'll check on AB, 1, 2, 3, 4, and from 2 to 8 is 6. So 4 squared plus 6 squared equals AB squared, and that's 52. So AB is the square root of 52, which is 2 root 13. Okay, so the length of this mid-segment, if I call it MN, the same way they did before, mn is half of 4 root 13 plus 2 root 13, which is half of 6 root 13, which is 3 root 13. So that's averaging those two lengths there. That's one method. Now the other method here is determining what m and n are as points by doing midpoints. Now I was probably very lucky in landing on what I believe the actual midpoints are, this has to do with, you know, taking half the length of down 10 over 2 to down 5 over 1. So this M midpoint is 1, 5. This N midpoint, you go 1, 2, 3, 4 over and then 6 up. Instead of 4 over 6 up, go 2 over and 3 up at 10, negative 1. So what happens when you go down and over this amount? Just do Pythagorean theorem on this one. So down 6 and over 9. So let's check that one out. mn squared is 36 plus 81. That's um, 6 squared plus 9 squared. So mn squared is uh, 117. Is that a... I guess. mn... mn is square root of 117. Uh, uh, 117, that's 9 and... 13, right, uh, 3 root 13. So you get the same answer regardless of which way you go. I kind of liked the second one more when it came to stuff. The other one just kind of applies more to what we've been doing with mid-segments when it's not on a graph, and I think that's equally as important. So maybe I'll just do one method the next time, the one that seems more feasible based on the logic of the problem. Let's go to number 14. Number 14, stay in window range. Ooh, that 13 is not cooperating. This is probably where they're like, don't do it on a graph, sir. You're supposed to do it on your own, you know? It's a neg negative two, four, negative two, negative four. Okay, so maybe these ones are uh, three, negative, never mind. Three, negative two. I was hoping these would be the parallels. 13 and 10. 11, 12, 13, and up 10. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that looks like totally like 13, huh? Probably a little farther out even. There we go. All right, so S... T, U, V for very far. V for very far. What's parallel? Well, T, U, and S, V, I'm going to imagine. Unless I did something wrong. So, I'm going to go more on the midpoint version this time. Because I don't want to do that big count and then have to try and simplify that radical. I think that's one reason to do it. So you can tell we got a midpoint right here. I'll call that one M. This is at negative 2, 0. 
let's uh, write that on the outside. M is at negative two, zero. And then N, we gotta go from negative two up to 10, halfway of that one, two, three, four, five, six. And then over here, oh. Well, I, I didn't make this to scale, did I? So we gotta go from three to 13. So, okay, so six and one, two, three, four, five. Okay, this would theoretically be the other midpoint right here. If I, cause I don't have V exactly in the right spot, but pretty close. Sure, uh, there's N. Okay, so we have our stuff there that's at eight, four. So, you know, I'm counting half the distance if you weren't sure on how I was kind of getting that. Counting half those distances. So we'll find the length of the mid segment there, which should be parallel to these. So how much rise and run up this over that up four and from negative two to eight is 10. So MN squared is four squared plus 10 squared. Unlike the square root of 117, 116 is not a factor of nine. 116, but it is a factor of uh, four. 29, two root 29 is what I'm going with there. Yeah. Okay, there's the length there. And, you know, like I said, why might I not do it that way? Because that doesn't help resolve how we do it here. So this is very specific to a graph working on midpoints, but I did touch on how we can do it uh, the other way as well. All right, numbers 15 through 18, we're going to find the measure of angle G. Now, these are not trapezoids. These are kites. And there is no isosceles kite versus a kite or anything like that. These are just kites. Now, kites do have very special properties some of which we, where's measure of angle G? So some of which we got to work based off of uh, what kind of angle we have here. G and E are going to be congruent to each other in this problem. So I'll call it X just to make it easier for myself. These two X's add with 140 and you get 360. A quadrilateral's interior angle sum is 360 degrees, not any different for a kite. Because these are both x's, we can kind of establish it that way. They would both be congruent in this kite. 2x plus 140 is 360, 2x is 220, and x is 110. The measure of angle g will also be 110 degrees. Like so. So that's the method we got there. Okay, number 16, the same thing. This time I'll just call it measure of angle G. This H being a right angle means it's a 90 degree angle. So 16, two measure of angle G's, because measure of angle E is the same, right? Plus 90 plus 150 is also 360. 90 plus 150 is 240. Subtract the 240 and divide by 2. So 2 times the measure of angle G is 120. And measure of angle G is 60 degrees. Probably also drawn to scale. Measure of angle E would be the same. Numbers 17 and 18 have the opposite effect now. G and E are not congruent or equal in measure this time because now they are the ends of the kite, which will not be congruent. F and H, however, will be the same. So if H is 110 degrees, so is F. Now we're trying to find G based on that. Pretty straightforward. These add to 360, all the same. Measure of angle G plus the 60 plus the 210s. Add to 360. I'm writing faster than I can think. We're thinking faster than I can write 220 plus 60. So measure of angle G is 80 degrees on number 17. And then number 18, same as before, H and F will be the same, both 90 degree angles. Two 90s are 180. This can probably, this can go even faster. If two 90s are 180, then E and G are supplementary to each other. Measure of angle G plus 110 is 180. So measure of angle G 
is 70 degrees. Something that you'll learn a little bit more with, well, with circles. There's something regarding circles in this that... Um, I don't know if I want to talk about it until we get into circles. But that's something that you would actually learn there. I mean, I, I said the math out loud, but there's that. All right, number 19. Uh, in 20, error analysis, describe and correct the error in finding DC. They have DC as AB minus MN and being a length of six. I don't think so. Uh, DC is going to be, I mean, I don't know why they decided to come up with that. That's, I'm just going to say they're wrong. Uh, you need to find the average. Um, this method is incorrect. Because mn is the average of, okay, so I guess that's the way to put it. It's the average of these two, uh, AB and DC, not part of the sum to make the other base length. So let's go ahead and correct it. So being the average of these two, DC, well, I don't even want to put it, I mean, I don't want to put it that way. I want to do it the same way I did before. 8 MN's length. Let me do that first because they kind of do that. MN is um, half of AB plus DC. Let's, uh, let's figure out how to write that without plugging things in first. If I double that, 2 MN's is AB plus DC. So DC is an AB minus MN, but AB minus 2 MN. There we go. Okay. Uh, duh, that makes sense. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. So, no, I'm sorry. That's not right. 2, two MN minus AB. 2 MN minus, I was going to say, something's wrong with that. 2 MN minus AB. Okay. So, DC is going to be 2 eighths minus 14. is two yeah uh, the 14 minus 6 <laughs> is 8 and 8 minus 6 is 2 is another way that I kind of do some of those okay that's number 19 number 20 that was a trapezoid and a mid segment a kite finding the measure of angle a they said opposite angles of a kite are congruent, so measure of angle A equals 50 degrees. It's true for one set of opposite angles, but not true for this set of opposite angles. A kite has one pair of congruent opposite angles, and it is not from the included angle made by consecutive congruent sides. So A um yeah so it's not that's not what a is d b and d are 120. so we're going to find a by adding these to 360 and subtracting the result so measure of angle a we just did some problems like these plus 120 plus 50 plus 120 is 360. 240 290 it's going to be 70 degrees. Measure of angle A is 70 degrees. Not 50. Come on. Pfft. What are they thinking? What are they thinking, right? Hmm. All right. Numbers 21 to 24. Give Now, here's where, here's where it's unfortunate. This was the last kinds of problems in the section, for the most part, that we had until we got to the exercise things. That must mean we're getting to word problems soon. I don't actually know, but we'll see. Give the most specific name for the quadrilateral. Explain your reasoning. Um, the explanation stuff's always kind of tough for me as far as going like, well, here's what it is. So number 21 is a rectangle by definition. Um, a definition of a rectangle literally just like that's what it is. It has um, all right angles. And there's nothing else to say that it's not a square, for example. I don't want to dive into that, but there's not enough there. Number 22. Number 22 is a trapezoid. So the reason why number 22 is a trapezoid and you know, they don't really say anything more on that, but you know what we have here, we, we have parallel lines. Um, this is the converse of the same side interior angle theorem. No, actually better yet with the right angles. 
two lines perpendicular to the same line. No, a, a line perpendicular to two different... Two lines perpendicular to the same line are parallel to each other. Boom, boom. Uh, I don't know what the theorem is called. The parallel perpendicular line theorem. I don't know. Because PS is parallel to QR as they are both perpendicular to SR. Uh, as, yeah, to SR. One pair of parallel sides. We know, and I'll, I'll say this if there's more to include. P and Q are not going to be congruent angles because they also have to be supplementary. If these add to 180, then so will these, that kind of thing. So I know it's also not, for instance, a rectangle, a parallelogram, something like that. Um, so that's going to work itself out that way. All right, 23. 23 would be a rhombus by all the congruent sides, but then you have a right angle. So this is a square. It is a rhombus because of the congruent sides, but one right angle in this situation, in, in any parallelogram, which a rhombus is, makes all right angles. So by definition, it is a square. So yeah, you know, opposite sides, excuse me, opposite angles of any parallelogram are congruent, boom. Op uh, consecutive angles of any parallelogram are supplementary, boom. These would all be like that, that would be a square. Good question. Number 24, I mean, hey, it's a kite. It's a definition. Let's go fly a kite. Imagine we have to have kites somewhere here, right? Kite by definition, quite. All right. Okay, let's see what's next. And I know these questions are hard for people to determine things with. It's it's hard for me to explain, you know, even as a teacher. It's like I have to come by and find ways to really explain it through. Even though I feel I have an answer in my head, getting it out isn't the same thing. And it's not through a visual. It's through understanding of the things you have. In exercises 25 and 26, tell whether enough information is given in the diagram to classify the quadrilateral by the indicated name. Explain. You know, sometimes with explanations are... Like, they're asking, is this, is 25 a rhombus? Uh, no. Because other, well, here's, here's the other thing that I'm going to say. Um, well, I'll, I'll bring it up in a second. No, all we know, all we know is the diagonals are perpendicular. And this can be true of any quadrilateral. So... I wonder if this would be true to say for rhomb like if this were also a square, could we also call it a rhombus? Yes. But here's the thing, this could also be a kite, such as a kite. I mean, it can really be anything. We know this of a kite though. And kites don't have parallel sides in that way, right? I could make any as long as I make diagonals perpendicular, like this. Okay, as long as they're perpendicular to each other. I mean, this isn't a rhombus. This is just a quadrilateral but they're perpendicular to each other's diagonals remember we don't go based off of the drawing so they drew it to look rhombus like they obviously made the diagonals look very perpendicular they should have but that doesn't mean that we go based off the drawing they want you to kind of figure out for yourself that other things can happen there so that's what i'm saying my explanation may not be great but i'm countering that example with saying i mean it could be a kite it could, it could be a trapezoid it could be anything um, that's not enough information. A square. No. <laughs> so. No. These are the earmarks of a rectangle. Um, uh, right angles. All right angles. And congruent diagonals that bisect each other. So it would need more to be a square. We would either need one set of consecutive sides congruent, the diagonals either bisecting their angles or perpendicular to each other, 
something else that would tell me that it could also be a rhombus would make me say that yes it's a square but no to both of these otherwise okay sorry that was number 26 I know I didn't mark it on the thing number 27 in exercises 27 and 28 find the value of X well we're back to our mid segment stuff and I'll go ahead and write it out as I did before 12 and a half being the average of so you add these up divide by 2 now 3x plus 1 is one of the lengths and 15 is the other length once I double this, I will get 25, and I'm going to go ahead and combine like terms inside here. I'm going to subtract 16 and divide by 3. Uh, that's 9, and x equals 3. There's the setup for 27. I think that's all they want. We could you know, verify that that works, because this would become 10, and the average of 10 and 15 is 12.5. That's probably another way we could have done that problem. We could have found out what that number is, you know, 10, and then set 3x plus 1 equal to 10, which is, you know, more, more of the same number 28 um, 15 is the average of 3x plus 2 and 2x minus 2 as I double this let's combine like terms 3x plus 2x is 5x 2 minus 2 is 0 so we're down there uh, divide by 5 we get x equals 6 let's confirm that that works out 3 times 6 plus 2 is 20 and 2 times 6 minus 2 is 10 the average of 20 and 10 is 15 See, this was a little different. We couldn't just find out 15 is the average of what two numbers? What's well, more than 20 and 10? Could be 0 and 40, uh, 0 and 30. <laughs> Could be 14 and 16. So that's not so obvious until we actually find out what specific x makes those what we want them to. All right, number 29. Let's get tricky. This is where we start to do other kinds of questions, it looks like. And I'm um, still not really halfway through. We're past halfway, actually. Modeling with mathematics in the diagram NP np is 8 inches this is mid segment like and lr is 20 inches what is the diameter of the bottom layer of cake i didn't even notice this was a cake okay so what's the diameter of the bottom layer of cake what we want to do is let's find the length of mq by averaging 8 and 20 then this number and this number would average to make 20 for example so mq mq is the average of 8 and 20 uh, sorry, 8 and 20, which is 14. So MQ is 14. And, you know, these, these mid-segments actually just keep flowing the same amount here each time. This is adding 6 each time to kind of keep that consistent flow. Plus 6, plus 6, plus 6. I mean, we could do the average talk all that we want, but the point was we had to find 14 to make this work. That's all. So KS will be 26 units in length, whether you do the average bits or not, KS is 26. Number 30, problem solving. Make sure we're still good recording. Okay, less, um, less than an hour so far. You and a friend are building a kite. You need to stick, now I wonder if kites, before I keep going, do kites can be rhombuses and still like fly, right? It's not like it needs to look like this shape, totally. You and a friend are building a kite, you need to stick you need a stick to place from X to W, 18, and a stick to place from W to Z, 29. To finish constructing the frame, you want the kite to have the geometric shape to be a, uh, of a kite. How long does each stick need to be? Explain your reasoning. Um, so, I mean, the, I mean, I answered it. The to scale version of what we see would tell us straight up this needs to be 18 and this needs to be 29. But more so, they also give you, and you probably can't really see it very well, but they give you that these are congruent angles here. So even if it wasn't to scale, the ones that are congruent are where you start to see the sets of the opposite sides, not uh, consecutive sides congruent here. So X, W. I don't like when they ask me to explain because it's like because kites. X, W is 18 inches and W, Z would have to be 29 inches to maintain the definition of a kite um, to two pairs of consecutive sides congruent. All right. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. It's just that the explanation part's like, well, because kite. All right, numbers 31 and 30, uh, 31 to 34, determine which pairs of segments or angles must be congruent so you can prove this is the indicated quadrilateral. 
explain your reasoning. There may be more than one right answer. Ah, touche. So, um, especially when they give that away, like, well, you got to be careful. To make an isosceles trapezoid here, well, base angles would have to be congruent. So, wait, what do they want? Which pairs of segments or angles must be congruent? You can prove it's the indicated quadrilateral. So, oh, oh there may be more than one. Ah. They're right. Okay. For this number 31, clearly BC would be a base, AD would be a base. So the legs would be AB and CD. AB congruent CD for an isosceles trapezoid. Let's see. Isosceles trapezoid. That would be true. Or angle A congruent to angle D. I hate what they say explain and angle B congruent to angle C. So either this or that. See, an isosceles trapezoid has booms or booms as a truth to what you got there. Um, Given that B and A are already different measures, otherwise we'd be calling it potentially a rectangle, but given that we can do that there. Um, now for reasons, they would be based on, based on those theorems. Let me seek out what those theorems are named. Give me a second and go back to them because I, I don't remember theorems by name. Mid-segment theorem, no. Ba base uh, isosceles trapezoid base angles theorem. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just looking through this, my bad. Um, see, I don't have this theorem by name. I'm looking for the, the uh, legs congruent part. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if I really know the name. There, there isn't really theorem. So the different, sorry that I do that during these problems. It's just because the way that my stuff is formatted on uh, the screen would cut stuff off and it, and it looks unprofessional if I do that. So now I gotta find my page again though. That's the problem, here it is. Um, I mean, it works. The only problem is that they don't identify this as a trapezoid. Oh, it is, oh, you can tell it's a trapezoid. I take this all back. Because these are supplementary there, then you can tell it's a trapezoid. So, okay, I can do these by name. Um, so, base angles theorem. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm not going to explain it. I'm not going to explain it. Because um, I don't want it to go back and forth. There's like a base angles converse or something like that. Actually, I don't even need both together. I would just need one set. Either one boom or the other or the other yeah that that actually works okay all right sorry about that it took me a little bit number 32 kite determine which pairs of segments or angles must be can you can prove so number 32 so for a kite i can either do with those two things congruent and bisecting that angle I mean I'd have to get deep into knowing a for sure for sure I suppose if you knew that these were congruent here you'd be good because we can then say these triangles are congruent this way therefore CPCTC totally so I could say for a kite here one of them is angle B A C congruent to angle C, uh, D, A, C. Now this is like my reasoning here is like angle side angle and C, P, C, T, C. I mean, my reasoning here is for a different breed that would say, therefore I can say those two are congruent, those two are congruent, stuff like that. That would put everything together just by that bisecting angle set. Um, that one's probably the least obvious one based on what we learned about kites to begin with. I could also say BA congruent to AD, like just straight up, let's just say these two sets are congruent here. Um, um, wait, I could just say if BC was congruent 
BC was congruent to DC as well. So just this and this, because once again, triangles would be congruent. I, I keep marking this set congruent by the reflexive property, by the way. Um, just BC congruent to DC would be enough for a kite as well. I mean, yeah, there are so many different answers we can do here, guys. There, there's um, angle B congruent to angle D. No, because that doesn't guarantee it's not a square or something like that. In fact, here, see, this could be a rhombus. This is tough then um, because I would need to state things that aren't congruent to each other as well. So I don't know how to answer these ones best without saying, because what I showed here is also true of a rhombus. You know, that's what makes this a little bit tougher to kind of give guarantees of things that way. Because um, a kite can't be a rhombus is the way that I would basically be going about this conversation so you know I don't know on this one um especially when it comes to reasoning my my justification and reasoning stuff's kind of eh I'll go ahead and say that because then I'll have to say things that aren't congruent but anyway so my reasoning here would be side angle side and CPCTC, basically showing two sets of triangles congruent in that way as well. And listen, there's more than one answer. There's more than one answer. Um, there's probably a bunch. So here are just some sample answers for you. All right, number 33. This is slow down for me having the right kind of conversation with you guys on it. Parallelogram. So we have one set of diagonals, or one diagonal bisecting the other in this parallelogram. Well, you know what else would be nice is to know that BE was congruent to DE, the other parallelograms, uh, the other diagonal set. Diagonals converse. The parallelogram diagonals converse would be one thing. Um, if the diagonals bisect each other there, I mean, guys, there's so many things. Congruent BC congruent to AD and BA uh, AB congruent CD, right? It's just the opposite sides, converse. I mean, we could say angles, we could say opposite angles, congruent stuff. This gets a little too much for me. Um, I'm trying to think of one that would just be nice and fast to say. Those are good. I'm, I'm good with that. I mean, angles galore could, could really show up there. Number 34, square. I really just need to show, and I, I mentioned this before. I really need to show that one set of consecutive sides is congruent. I don't need to show all sets of sides are congruent here. Because I already know it's a rectangle, and a rectangle already has opposite sides congruent. I just need one set of consecutive sides, such as segment AB congruent segment BC. Um, and Shor's rhombus. Because it's already a parallelogram. It ensures a rhombus that way. So A, B, and B, C, or B, C, and C, D, or C, D, and A, D, or A, D, and A, B, things like that. So that works. Okay. Moving on over, number 35. All right, now we gotta start writing some proofs. Uh, 30, 35 and 36. Write a proof that KM is a mid-segment of triangle JLN. Excuse me, that's a given. Prove that this is an isosceles trapezoid. Where? Oh, JK, I don't know why I didn't see that. All right, so um, I'll leave the diagram there. Let's go to statements and reasons. It's one of those things where I got to think of the scope of what I'm allowed to use and what I'm not allowed to use. So statements, reasons. All right, number one. What time is it? I think it's there. Um, J L is congruent to L N. Now I can mark that, but it's kind of tough with K M in the middle. I'll just kind of do that. 
Oh, that looks weird. Um, and KM is a mid segment. Given. KM is a mid segment of triangle J L N. All right, a lot of things are then known for mid segments. We know parallel parallel lines here. This is to show it's a trapezoid. So K not isosceles, but a trapezoid. KM segment KM will be paralleled segment JN by definition of mid segment That's what mid segments are, what they do there. They also form midpoints. I don't think I want to go to, the, it's a midpoint by definition. Oh, fine, I'll do that. Uh, K is midpoint of JL, and M is midpoint of LN. Also, definition of mid-segment. Now, the part I always have trouble with here without doing a bunch of parts. Uh, JK is congruent to KL. So now these two guys are congruent here. And then LM is con congruent to MN. But they're all congruent to each other. That's the part where I don't want to get into this big half of this and substitution of. I just want some sort of form of transitive property here. And I don't really know how I can get into that. They're really all congruent to each other. The definition of midpoint. So definition of midpoint. Um, yeah, how there's got to be some some form of transitive property thing I can say and sorry if this is the wrong way of saying it it's just the faster go around than doing this whole substitution thing half of this is equal to all that so I'm just gonna say straight up guys I apologize segment KJ is congruent to segment M N by transitive property uh, you can see based on the diagrams how that's gonna be true it was important that LJ was congruent to LN for this to happen so I'm doing it more based off the diagram of the thing, and I think we can understand that. Now that we have a trapezoid with the parallel part, and we have congruent legs, we have congruent legs, quadrilateral J, K, M, N is an isosceles trapezoid by definition of isosceles trapezoid. So that's just the whole thing that we have there. All right, that's going to work for me. Number 36. Given ABCD is a kite, and we have all that proof, A, B, and C, D. Well, isn't that definition of a kite? Oops, I don't want that. Oh, I think they need to tell you which ones are congruent. Yeah, that's okay. Prove that CE is congruent to AE. Okay. Well, I think them telling you it's a kite means we can use the perpendicular diagonals thing. So I'm probably going to. All right, so ABCD is a kite. All right, I'm gonna go based off that definition right now. Based on definition of a kite, I can say that CA is perpendicular, segment CA is perpendicular to segment BD at E, at point E. Um, definition, uh, not definition of kite, uh, diagonal um, kite, diagonal property. Diagonals are perpendicular in a kite. See, they never did mention. So what we're doing right now, CE congruent to AE, I don't think they ever mentioned in the notes, right? That's why I brought it up. One diagonal bisects the other diagonal in a kite. One is a perpendicular bisector of the other. That's what we're actually showing right now. So these being perpendicular, boom. 
And they're saying that both these sets are congruent here. I'm not really going to use, well. Let me save, let me pocket this for one moment, guys. I am going to use this step, but I'm going to use it later. I won't call it step two when the time comes. Let me pocket, oh my goodness. Let me pocket that one for later. Let's talk about these two triangles being congruent first, because I was saying, I wonder why we'd want to use both sets of things. Let's just go into that one first, and then we'll use that perpendicular part, because I think I will need to. I think I'll need to then. I just need to prove something else here very fast. Uh, let's do AB congruent CB. Even though this would kind of be a kite definition, they just need to show us which ones. AD congruent to CD. All right, now all of BD is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. So that line down the middle, reflexive property of congruence. Now these two triangles are congruent here, this BDC and BDA. I'll call it BCD and BAD. Triangle. BCD is congruent to triangle BAD by side, side, side congruence. And basically what I'm going to do now off of this, I wanted to prove a set of angles congruent. So I'm gonna be able to prove this angle is congruent to this angle right here. Um, because it's based on these bigger triangles here and off CPCTC I can use that. Then I'm going to use that next part. So I can say angle CBE is congruent to angle ABE by CPCTC. And this is where I'm going to talk about the perpendicularity portion because now I can use an angle angle side congruence thing here. But this is going to be statement six, not statement two. So let's erase that, call it six. Okay, now that I have these here, take a look. Now I have these inner, inner triangles. I'm gonna prove another set of triangles congruent here and here, and then use CPCTC one more time. So before that, I need to say that angle CEB and angle AEB are right angles by definition of perpendicular lines. Hold on, I have one too many uh, things here. And then uh, angle CEB congruent to angle AEB. Uh, by the right angle theorem. All right angles are congruent basically. So now that I have that, now I can use this angle, angle, side. So two more steps. Um, triangle CEB congruent to triangle AEB using angle, angle, side. See what's marked. I'm really including this set as well. Whoops. There we go. Angle, angle, side. And lastly, CE is congruent to AE, CPCTC. So now I'm gonna say that these two, boom, 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 congruent to boom, boom, boom. CE congruent to AE, CPCTC. Okay. That's probably more complete than the one I did before that. And I'm going for it, it looks good. Sorry if I was ever cutting off some of my writing uh, with my face there. I wasn't really looking at my own screen. All right, abstract reasoning number 37. Point U lies on the perpendicular bisector of segment RT. Describe the set of points. So now that we saw the perpendicular bisector thing, this might work out. Describe the set of... Oh. Oh, this is a line. Describe the set of points S for which RSTU is a kite. RSTU the set of points s s would kind of be over here but i don't know what they mean point u lies on the perpendicular bisector of rt so this guy is the bisected part s can be anywhere on here
I don't know what they mean by describe the points as. They they just got to be on the other side of you. Unless a kite... I guess a kite can still... I don't think there's anything that restricts a kite from being concave like that. Like, boom. I think it's still a kite by definition. Right? Yeah. Why not? Um, so as long as it's on this line uv but it's not u or v i believe that s can be any point s can be any point on line uv that is not on u or v itself so it can be on the line but cannot be on those individual points and then it's a kite oh Hold on. It also can't be. It also can't be because this can't be a rhombus. Nor can it be equidistant to V as U is. Wait. It can it cannot be the same distance from V as U is. You mean as you are? No, as U is. That's that's kind of where I'm going with that answer. Um, I, that makes sense to me, at least, whenever I think about it. Because it can't be on you either. So, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Okay, number 38. Determine whether the points here are the vertices of a kite. Explain your reasoning. We're going to have to graph that and figure it out. Um, I see a proof down below, which is rattles me to my core. Number 38. All right. All right. A is at 4, 5. B is at negative 3, 3. You'll notice I don't write the letters to begin with because I don't know where the other points are going to be yet. And it looks like C is down low. So C is at negative, uh oh, negative 13. And D is at 6, negative 2. Is it a kite? Well, I'm going to go based off of. Uh, Perpendicular diagonals is not enough. So I'm not going to do the diagonals. I'm just going to go based off of some lengths if we can get sets of congruent sides here. So honestly, guys, it's just about a count. Yes, I'll use Pythagorean theorem to find out the official lengths themselves, but this is really just a slope count thing. It's likely the answer is going to be yes. We ain't come this far to make it be no, right? Let's see. This is over 2 and down from 5 there, so 7. This is up two, and from three to four is seven. So those are good. Both of these lengths, 40, root 53, root 53. Now let's check on these guys. From B to C, that's from negative three to negative six, that's three. And negative six, negative three. So negative 13 up to three, that's 16. Ooh, so this, these counts may not be the same, doesn't mean that Pythagorean theorem will make them the same length. So I do have to use Pythagorean theorem this time. So from negative 6 to positive 6 is 12, and from negative 13 to negative 2 is 11. So let's check this one. So AD, AD equals BD. That's a for show. Well, you know what I could do? I could check if the diagonals are opposite reciprocal slopes. That's just not enough for a kite. But if they weren't opposite reciprocal slopes, that would mean it's not a kite. Uh, AD equals BD. But now let's check out CD's and BD's length. So BC is 256 plus 9. All right. I'm just going to keep BC squared right now as 265. Let's see if we get 265 for this other one. I think we do. So CD squared is 12 squared plus 11 squared. Yeah, that's also 265. So BC is square root of 265. The only thing is I don't know if that's like a, you know, a number. Uh, 50. I don't think it is. I think it's just 265. So CD is also 265. BC equals CD. So because of this and because AD equals BD as root 53, this is a kite. Very, very nice on uh, those guys there. Being different, but the same. Okay. 
Proving a theorem. We're going to use the diagram to prove the given theorem. In the diagram, EC is drawn parallel to AB. We're going to prove this is an isosceles. No, excuse me. We're going to prove that in an isosceles trapezoid, we have A congruent to DB. That base angles are congruent to each other. <coughs> so 39 isosceles traps. Oh, I just noticed that it said base angles theorem there. Okay, statements. I have my reasons. Okay. A, B, C, D is isosceles trapezoid. That will mean by definition these two things are congruent. So I'm going to mark, let's just do that now. A, B is congruent to CD by definition of isosceles trapezoid. Now we can't say <coughs> we can't say that the angles are congruent by definition of isosceles trapezoid because that's that's a property. It's not the definition. This one's the definition here. All right, these ones are also parallel here. BC. Oh, excuse me. The given. Well, there are a couple of them. So BC, B, oh, BC is, con, uh, is parallel to AD given, but we're also EC is drawn parallel to AB. I don't know if we're saying, I guess we're saying draw it parallel to it. Let's do a double thing there. So we, we have a parallelogram here. Draw EC parallel to AB. That's a construction thing. By construction. All right, so we made a parallelogram. I want to think about what we're going to do off of that parallelogram. We could do a... A would be congruent to that. That doesn't matter much there. Congruent triangle isosceles triangle oh well I have something we could find out this is congruent to that and it's an isosceles triangle therefore those are congruent and in doing those congruent we could do these congruent here that doesn't help me we could do this congruent here by corresponding angles and then this, oh, B, C, D. Sorry, I'm, I'm building the rest of my proof. I want to kind of, kind of think about what I want to do. It's a parallelogram, opposite sides congruent and parallelogram, then isosceles triangle. I, that's a lot of work to just mention for all that kind of stuff with it being a parallelogram. But I want to find a way to just like angle addition postulate the heck out of that thing. We could do this math thing saying how they add to 180. I think that's a lot to take in. Um, I think once we know D is congruent to A, we can say the other. I think then we have enough. I think in the isosceles triangle, excuse me, in the isosceles trapezoid thing, that's enough. Same side interior angles and, and the like. I think that'll be enough there. So let's, let's go off that. Let me kind of draw things as I go. So we have the parallelogram. So A, B, C, E is a parallelogram. I'm just going to do the symbol. Definition of parallelogram. <laughs> Hopefully you know that I'm not saying trapezoid or anything like that. So AB is now congruent to CE. AB congruent CE by um, opposite sides converse parallelogram. Opposite sides Converse. Okay. Um, I don't know what the name is, but you know this is an isosceles triangle now, and then base base angles theorem or something like that. I don't know. I'll just go full bore. Triangle ECD is isosceles by uh, definition. 
and then angle. See, I feel like I'm doing a lot on this part. That's that's not really needed. Angle C E D is congruent to angle D. So these two are now congruent by the base angles theorem for a um, isosceles triangle. Now that C E D is also congruent to A. C E D is congruent to angle A because they're corresponding angles. Because that's the parallel lines thing. Um, okay, that works. So now D is congruent to A by transitive property of congruence. So angle D congruent to angle A by transitive property. Okay, now I need to just find a way to make mention of these other parts here. So we have supplementary angles based off the same side interior angles thing. So I can say angle B is supplementary to angle A. I'm just going to kind of do this in one step to angle A and angle BCD is supplement. I don't know if I need this part because I can probably use the other bit of the property, but I can't guarantee that I can, so I won't. So same side interior angle theorem. Also true of trapezoids. I, I don't know. And then number 12, angle BC. I, I, this, I don't know if this is transitive property as well. Two angles supplementary to congruent angles or congruent to each other. I the, the reasoning makes sense. It might not be the name of a property, but I can still say it. So angle B is congruent to angle BCD. two angles supplementary see there can be a math version of what we do I think that that gets rid of the point of what we're trying to say though supplementary to congruent angles are congruent to each other like I said though I probably could have done those last couple in one step though given that if there were other trapezoid properties I could use. And I think that kind of works out in its own way. Okay. Plus, I still have another proof to go. So here's the base angles converse. Now we have to work kind of the opposite way, and that might be a lot to do, or maybe a lot less, I'm not really sure. But number 40, ABCD is a trapezoid, and then we're going to be given some information. Let's erase some stuff. Um, we still get to use the EC. So the one that's parallel to that. I should probably use some of the stuff that I had before. This time they just say I is a trapezoid. We got to prove it's isosceles. I'm really curious. I'm like sweating over how many proofs I have left. I don't know because there's still another 12 questions after this. Or any one of them could be a proof, and I have no idea. So A, B, C, D. I mean, there have to be more kite ones, don't they? Don't they? And diagonal, congruent diagonals. for We haven't even done congruent diagonals at all yet for trapezoids, have we? I have no idea. So given we have a trapezoid, a trapezoid would make things parallel. Oh, they, they tell us that. Um, there's nothing else I want to say about it being a trapezoid other than the... Oh, I guess we get to use this now. Now that we get to use, I don't know. Angle A is congruent to angle D. Given. I'll tell you what, before I mention the other thing, let me go and find what the name of this other one was, the in a trapezoid. I need to see if this is only specifically for isosceles or not, and if I'm allowed to use it. Isosceles trapezoid base angles converse. If a trapezoid has a pair of congruent base angles, okay, then this is the one we're proving, so I can't use that. Okay, okay, I don't think I can use that. Because that is the one, that is what we're proving. So I'm going back to our questions now. Oh, I'm, I went too far forward. All right, here we go. Um, Q 
can I just use what I used before? That two angles, congruent supplementary angles are congruent to each other. This this isn't enough to just call it isosceles because that's it's not a proof. Um, we're gonna draw this thing parallel. We're gonna call this thing congruent. We can use the side thing. I guess we're just gonna go that same version, but with isosceles triangles and the like. We don't really have to do anything on that. So uh, BC is parallel to AD. Okay, um, draw EC parallel to AB by construction. Okay, so now these are parallel to each other here. So we now have a parallelogram. So same thing as before, definition of parallelogram. We're gonna do the things that are congruent, all that kind of stuff as before. So we just need to get AB congruent to CD. Yeah, I don't even know if I need A congruent to D really. We'll see. Um, a, B, C, E is a parallelogram. A, B congruent to C, E. Parallelogram opposite sides converse. Yeah, let's see. So now these are congruent to each other here. What I'm missing... Oh, last time this was... Okay, no, yeah, this will work. Okay, knowing these are congruent is good because now I can say this is congruent here. I could have before. But angle A is congruent to angle E. Not E, but uh, angle A is congruent to angle CED. So I... I probably could have stopped short. Okay, I'm sorry. And on the last one, I probably could have stopped short and saying in an isosceles trapezoid of one pair of base angles is congruent, then we're all good, but that's okay. But angle A is congruent to angle C, E, D, corresponding angles theorem. Um... Now we know this is an isosceles trapezoid again. Triangle ECD is isosceles. You know, I don't know if we have to say the isosceles part, but base. I'm just going to go straight to base angles converse. These are now congruent to each other by base angles converse because, yeah, we already have those parts congruent. Oh, we have to actually first say that, though. Angle... D is congruent to angle CED by transitive property. And then we go to those sides. I hope I used that last time. I hope I used transitive property when I was able to. So now CE is congruent to CD. C is congruent to CD by converse of base angles theorem, I think is what it's called. So that's marked. So now we can say that AB is congruent to CD. AB is congruent to CD by transitive property because we have AB is congruent to CE before. So transitive property again. And that should be enough to now say it's isosceles. So. A, B, C, D is an isosceles trapezoid. A, B, C, D is an iso trapezoid. Hopefully that's a good trapezoid look by definition. <laughs> because it now has the uh, legs congruent. Okay. I feel okay on that. I feel like I proved something. I don't, oh, I see a proof on 44. I'm scrolling down to see. I see a proof on 44, but that's uh, the diagonals one, I think. No, it's something else. Um, okay, number 41. Maybe that's the last one, though. Making an argument. Your cousin claims there is enough information to prove JKLM is an isosceles trapezoid. Is your cousin correct? Explain.
Well, it could be a rectangle, which is my concern. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if that's what they mean when it comes to countering it, because that's what's coming in my head. Um, because if those are right angles, then that does make a rectangle. So I don't know if that's what they mean, though. Um... I think that's probably what they mean. Like, this this would be enough information to make an isosceles trapezoid if it's a trapezoid. So, in this case here, no, because it could be a rectangle. And then by extension, it could also be a square. Yeah, because those could be right angles if, if the congruent angles are right angles. And we are being very specifically clear that trapezoids are not ever kites, are not ever parallelograms, that they are distinguishable, distinguishably different shapes. So I'm going to say that about your friend. Mathematical connections, number 42. The bases of a trapezoid lie on the lines y equals 2x plus 7 and y equals 2x minus 5, which are parallel. Write the equation of the line that contains the mid-segment of the trapezoid. I'm going to guess y equals 2x plus 1. Um, they don't ask me to explain why, but um, if these are two y equals equations, I don't know if this works by saying to average them, but here's basically what I'm doing. Uh, I'll go and use the graph. I'm Because the slopes are the same, I'm just going to average the... So here's my 2x plus 7. You know, right here. Right, here's here's among one of the bases. The ba One of the bases is here. The other is on 2x minus 5. Something right here. These are parallel lines. So somewhere here we make a trapezoid, right? The trapezoid, for all we know, could be this. It could, you know, whatever. But the mid-segment's going to be the in-between. And in-between, negative 5 and 7 is 1 as far as those things go. And I imagine that that's the exact in-between uh, when it comes to distance. That, yeah, that, that would be a mid-segment. So y equals 2x plus 1 is my answer. It's got to be the same slope, first of all. But 5 or 7 plus negative 5 divided by 2. I'm averaging those right there. And the slope is 2. They don't ask me to explain, but that's what I'm going to say that for that one. Number 43. A B oh, construct. Oh, I didn't know there was construction. I knew there was a proof coming up. I didn't know there. And there are two of them. AC and BD bisect each other. Construct quadrilateral ABCD so that AC and BD are congruent but not perpendicular. Classify the quadrilateral. Justify your answer. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make an AC. So I need to make them bisect, which means I still need to make a midpoint, which means I still need to make a perpendicular bisector, even if I don't end up using the perpendicular portion of it. But there's AC. Here's my, whenever I activate it, it goes all the way to the top of the screen, so I have to bring it down. Here's my compass. Let's go to work where we will, and this is just part A, and none of this might be perfectly to scale. Apologies on that because the way that this thing rotates on the pivot thing is never perfect, like as far as endpoints go. So I'm making a perpendicular bisector just to find the midpoint itself. I'm doing it for no other reason because it can't be perpendicular. So we're doing that. My goal was to get this point right here. And I did. Now I got to draw another line through it and make it the same length. Oh, the other needs to be a perpendicular bisector of the other. 
excuse me, a bisector of the other. They bisect each other. Okay, oh, that's fine. So, okay, I have all that. Let's kind of, let's do this. Let's make these a little more transparent. Generally, I erase it all, but then you don't see all my hard work. So let's just make it really transparent looking. Now let's do this. Let's find out what this length is right here from A, from there to A, you know, like that, that length. And I can just draw it. I can literally just draw it all around, right? Like, okay, yeah, look, this can basically be, although that didn't really work because this pivots down the right spot anymore. I basically draw a circle. Okay, perfect. Anywhere on this circle, I can just draw two other endpoints. Why don't I think of this stuff? So let's do it like here. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's do it like that, maybe. So here, same length, which means this is also a midpoint of this guy. Once I made the circle around there. Cool. I've, I, you know, I'm thinking as I go. Okay. So I'll call that one BD. Whoops. And they needed to be congruent. Not only do they bisect each other, but they're congruent. So that they're congruent, but not perpendicular. Classify the quadrilateral. Justify your answer. Well, it's going to be a rectangle, but let's, uh, let's actually draw the rest of it. Looks rectangular enough to me, even though I probably didn't get everything perfect. So, this is a rectangle. This is part A, by the way. A. So that didn't take too long, but rectangle. The diagonals bisect each other. So it is a parallelogram. And a parallelogram, I don't know why I need to do this to show that though. And a parallelogram with congruent diagonals is a rectangle. Yeah. Now it could have been a square, but because they're not perpendicular to each other, uh, it is not a square because the diagonals are not perpendicular to each other. Okay, so there is part A for number 43. And see, you know, this is all about tra trapezoids and kites. So I was imagining to get one of those, but I guess not. I guess they do want to talk about some of the other quadrilaterals, which is kind of nice. Sorry, I need part B, 43B. Almost skipped it completely. Construct so that AC and BD are perpendicular, but not congruent. Classify the quadrilateral, justify your answer. Now they are going to bisect each other still. Right? They bisect. Okay, this I think this will be a rhombus then. So let's do the same bits. I'm going to have some AC. Wait, they're what? Perpendicular but not congruent, but they still have to bisect each other. Oh. I think from that other part. Okay, I think from the other part, I just need to make another circle around that point. That's all. It doesn't need to be anything else particularly interesting. So compass, let's get a little lower here and call this AC again. I mean, I got you, look, it's gonna be a rhombus, but interesting that night neither of these were trapezoids or kites then, given the chapter or the section we're in. All right, let's go beyond, give ourselves a little yeah, and a little yeah, yeah. All right, let's get ourselves that thing. Now, I do want this figure in general like that. So I wanted perpendicular, and I just need to make sure that it's not congruent to this other guy. And I do need to, listen, I needed it to bisect, and technically what I drew to these ends would be make it bisected but I want to make sure it's not congruent. So I am going to shrink the length rather than grow it. I'll shrink it. I'll draw something around here and I'll make these points here B. it looks like this circle's a little off center here. That might be a little better. I'll make this one B and D. 
So BD is bisected by nature of kind of what's going on there um, from the circle center, that kind of stuff. And it just does not look very congruent at all based on the construction. So hide that away. And let's make that thing. It's a rhombus. It's a rhombus. Same kind of reasoning that we were mentioning before in that it's a parallelogram, but then it has perpendicular diagonals. So here we go. And it looks like one to me. Not a kite, not a trapezoid. So rhombus, it is a parallelogram because of the bisected diagonals and the perpendicular diagonals make it a rhombus. <clears throat> it is not a square because the diagonals are not congruent. Okay, and so that is number 43. Number 44, write a proof. Hopefully the last, no guarantees, but let's check it out. As long as you learn, right? QRST is an isosceles trapezoid. Prove the angle TQS is congruent to SRT. I'm probably going for congruent triangles and CPCTC here. So, whoops. Now, can we can we say I don't know which one we're allowed to say whether the diagonals are congruent or the base angles are congruent for isosceles trapezoid. This seems like a really fast proof though, one way or the other. Here's my plan. Isosceles trapezoid means these are congruent. It would also mean diagonals are congruent. I don't know if that's a property I can speak of, but I guess diagonals are congruent and this is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. So triangles congruent by side, 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 or these base angles here being congruent. I don't know if either is allowed to be stated or if I'm required to do more as a result. I'm just trying to think about which one that would be. Um, I think we're allowed to say that diagonals are congruent. S, Q, and R, T. Can I say the diagonals are congruent? I feel like that was another proof. I feel like we haven't proved that yet. If we haven't talked about the diagonals, I'm going to avoid talking about the diagonals being congruent. I'll say the base angles here are congruent. That's fine. That's fine. Because we've done a bunch of those ones, right? So let's do, let's just do that. This should be a short proof though. So one QRST is isosceles trapezoid. QT, segment QT is congruent segment RS by definition of isosceles trapezoid. Um, so now I'm gonna say those angles are congruent. This QTS and RST. Angle QTS. Base angles of isosceles trapezoid are congruent. Okay, and TS is congruent to ST. This is this bottom guy right here. This is the reflexive property. And we'll have two congruent triangles based off that. So I'll imagine them for you. So TS congruent to ST by reflexive property of congruence, shared side. So now we're talking about this triangle congruent to this triangle. This is gonna be a side angle side bit. So these two triangles will be congruent and by CPCTC, these guys here will be congruent is what we're going for. So that's the end goal, right? Those, so two more steps. So, um, triangle QTS is congruent to triangle RST by side angle side and then angle TQS angle TQS congruent to angle SRT by CPCTC. Okay, and that's it. 
was a short one. Again, I don't think we've talked about the congruent diagonals at all yet. So I feel like it's something we're avoiding using. We can't use it in the scope of the problem unless we proved it. We've done a lot with the base angles already to say it. All right, what does this have to do with trapezoids or kites? Um, a plastic spider web is made in the shape of a regular dodecagon where segment AB is parallel to segment, oh, right here, PQ. Oh, that must be a trapezoid. And X is equidistant. Where's X? Oh, in the middle. From the vertices of the dodecagon, are you given enough information to prove A, B, P, Q is an isosceles trapezoid? Regular dodecagon, parallel parts, side, side congruent, wait, it's not congruent to anything else. Um, parallel, equidistant, yeah, we proved, well, we proved it with the mid-segment. I think within we have mid-segments. I, I feel like that would be enough from there. I don't know. It kind of, it kind of seems like, like, yeah. Um, it doesn't ask me to explain, but I think that that's a Yes based off the stuff there. So yes, we have the parallel, we have the equidistance thing, and we have the regular dodecagon thing. I'm just gonna say yes, it doesn't really ask me to explain. Uh, what's the measure of each interior angle of A, B, P, Q? So let's start with the regular dodecagon thing. So a regular dodecagon interior angle sum is 180 times 12 minus 2 or 180 times 10 which is 1800 and each interior angle measure an entire boom interior angle measure like this which I imagine I can only imagine is bisected with this equidistance thing so each interior angle measures 1800 divided by 12 which I think is 150 degrees now, measure of angle B would be 150 over 2, which is 75 degrees. So there's measure of angle B. Measure of angle A would be the same. Measure of angles P and Q are going to be the same, which is 180 minus 75 and 105 degrees. So I found the interior angle measure of a regular dodecagon of each each interior angle measure of regular dodecagon and each of those are bisected by that plastic spider web bit dividing it into two. Those are the 75s. These other two would be the 105s right there for P and Q. Kind of fun. Number 46, attending to precision in trapezoid PQRS I'm going to kind of make this. I don't know if it's actually isosceles or not, but let's just draw one that kind of has the idea. So 46, PQRS, PQ is parallel to RS, and MN is the mid-segment. Therefore, parallel and congruent. They didn't say it's isosceles, so I'm just working off that. If RS is five times the amount of PQ, <laughs> what is the ratio of MN to RS? I, how is it, two and a half or something? I don't know, let's see. So RS is five times PQ. So here's the thing. MN is half, oh, I think it's gonna be three. Uh, RS plus PQ, and you can substitute five times PQ for RS, half of five times PQ, PQ plus PQ, which is half of six times PQ, which is three times PQ. So MN is three times PQ, what is MN to RS? So if MN is 3 PQs and RS is 5 PQs, 
I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with that now. Uh, what do I substitute? So PQ is MN over 3. Therefore, RS is 5 times MN over 3. Or RS, sorry about the writing, is 5 thirds that of MN. What is the ratio of MN to RS? Uh-oh, 5 to 3 or 3 to 5? Let me uh, multiply one more time. 3 RS's is 5 MN's. And MN to RS... Wait, which way do I say that? I don't want to be wrong. Well, here's the thing. MN is smaller than RS. So... If it was one to two boys to girls, there are less boys than there are girls. So it must be three to five. I think it's three to five. I don't want to be like wrong, wrong, but I believe that that's what they say MN to RS is for three to five. M would be the smaller one, S would be the larger one. So I believe three to five should be our answer or A. Okay. Anyway, so the algebra right there, I was just kind of multiplying both sides by three and such. I, I want to kind of say it correctly, but. I don't know. Sometimes I have to think of things out loud. You know, that's we all have to do it. And there was I. There I was. Number 47. Proving. Oh, boy. Another proof. Use the plan for proof below to write a paragraph proof of the kite opposite angles theorem. Um, okay. I'm going to do the same proof that I did before with side, side, side. I forget how indirect arguments work, so I'm going to have to think about what that one is. Um, so I don't think this is going to be very long, but, oh, it's not a, par it's a, okay, we get to do paragraph proof. Okay, so first, uh, so in, in kite, E, F, G, H, E, F, is congruent to FG and EH is congruent to GH. Okay, I'm going to draw a segment FH. I'm literally going to draw it in the diagram. So I'm drawing FH. <gasps> Let me get blue. And it's a diagonal as well. I'm drawing FH, which is congruent to itself by the reflexive property of congruence. Okay, before I move forward, I'm going to mark some things up and show you what I did so far. So, what I have so far are, first of all, let's include some more things on segments. Segment, congruent, segment, segment, congruent, segment, and segment. Okay. So now, also congruent to itself there. Boom. Therefore, oh, I know the indirect argument I want to make, I think. Therefore, triangle, oh, let me find my triangle symbol. Did I have one here? Did it exist? Let me check. Here it is. Triangle, get it copied and ready. FGH is congruent to triangle FEH by side, 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 congruence. Okay. Boom. And and so angle G uh, E is congruent to angle G by CPCTC. So those are the two corresponding parts G and E with that. Okay. So congruent by CPCTC. So there's the beginning part. So these two are congruent here. Now, my indirect argument is going to be based on the pretense that a kite cannot be a parallelogram. Therefore, those can't be congruent. So let's see how I do indirect arguments, uh, indirect uh, arguments again. I cannot exactly remember. Like, first we assume that it is true and stuff like that. Okay, that's what I think. Okay, to show that angle F is not congruent, 
See, I didn't know we were allowed to say the not congruent symbol. That's something I think I wanted to use before. I don't have that on here. So I'm going to do this for a second. Not congruent to angle H. Let's do a slash. And I didn't realize I had a congruent symbol here. First, let's temporarily assume that angle F is congruent to angle H. If so, then opposite both pairs of opposite angles, yeah, this will be fine, would be congruent, which would make EFGH a parallelogram. However, EFGH is a kite. And kites cannot be parallelograms. Therefore, angle F is not congruent to angle H. I also say, therefore, it's a kite. <laughs> Therefore, angle F is not congruent to angle H. OK, I think that works. I actually preferred that that was a paragraph proof. I just don't like make, marking the things up afterward. All right, number 48. How do you see it? Is that a diamond? One of the earliest shapes used for cut diamonds is called the table cut. I see trapezoids in there. Table cut, as shown in the figure. Each face of a cut gem is called a facet. So these are faces. There's a face, there's a face, there's a face, there's a face, things like that. BC is parallel to AD. I see it as a diamond. And AB, AB, is, uh, AB and DC are not parallel. What shape is the facet labeled ABCD? Well, it's a trapezoid. That's kind of what I was saying before. ABCD is a trapezoid. Don't explain it. DE is parallel to GF. DE and GF are congruent. DG and EF are congruent, not parallel. What shape is the facet label DE? Well, it's an isosceles trapezoid. Um, DEFG is an Sorry that I hand wrote one and did the other. Um, yeah, that was uh, too much information for not enough work. I'm good. Number 49, proving a theorem. How many more proofs do I have? In the diagram below, 49, 50, 52. I might have four more proofs here. In the diagram below, BG is the mid segment. How long have I gone? Over two hours. BG is the mid segment of triangle ACD and GE is the mid segment of triangle ADF. Use the diagram to prove the trapezoid mid segment theorem. Well, there are two, okay, so I don't know if we have to do a two column proof. I'm not going to really try to. But the trapezoid mid segment theorem can I guess go based off the triangle mid segment theorem so in this case here because of the diagrams guys BG if you remember triangle mid segment theorem BG is half the length of CD okay BG is half the length of CD and GE here is going to be half the length of AF now BG plus Oh, this is easy. BG plus GE together make BE. And all together, that's also going to be one half CD plus one half AF. Oh, this is really easy. So BE, if you take out the one half, it's one half CD plus AF. And that's the trapezoid mid segment theorem that is exactly half that. I think that's all I need. I think that's all I need. So what. What I said here was that these two added together make the whole thing, the whole thing being a mid-segment. This is half of this, this is half of that. When I add those things together, it's I'm basically doing a substitution there and that works itself out. Yes, I could do a like a two-column proof. 
but I don't want to. Am I required to do a two-column proof? A two-column proof would say triangle mid-segment theorem, triangle mid-segment theorem, and try. So, I don't know. I'm not really using the triangle, but triangle mid-segment theorem, triangle mid-segment theorem. Addition property, no, uh, just addition. Well, the seg segment addition postulate, substitution, and factoring. <coughs> mm, I think I did it. I didn't want to do two column proof if I didn't have to. Because they're already hurting me enough. See, whenever they say prove, this is where I want to use two column proofs. But they're hurting me enough with two or three more proofs here. Thought provoking. Is side side angle side side a valid congruence theorem for Kite's just fire answer? I have no idea what the heck they just said. Um, can I make a kite shape out of these? I don't think so. All right, so keep all right, so keep in mind what they're doing here. Um, let's say. I had two kites and sets of sides are congruent. This doesn't mean all the sides in one kite are congruent to each other. They're saying in two different kites, if I have sets of sides congruent with a known angle in between that's congruent, are they to be? I don't think so, because I could make another kite that has the same set of sides. Like I said, concave. I could make a concave set of kites right here. And I could do side, side, angle, side, well, I guess I'll just say side, side, and the kites aren't congruent. So no. One could be concave, one could be convex. See, triangles are need a lot less for that stuff. All right, two more questions. They're both proofs. We finally get to do the triangle, uh, the diagonal congruence proof here. Prove the biconditional statement theorem. You must prove both parts separately. Oh no, there's an A and a B, and then there's a three-dimensional shape. You guys, you guys. Uh, you guys why did I ever take this vow that I was going to do every single <laughs> problem I'm uh, not too happy about this one alright let's see here let's um what do we have it's an isosceles trapezoid so let's do uh, you guys All right, statements. What's great? If it was like my students, I'd give extra credit. I'll give someone extra credit in the comments section if they're listening to this part right now. And down in the comments section say, um, I'll have what he's having in that you're writing a proof because I'm writing the same proof. And then I'll know that someone was actually listening to this part and that it was worth it. JKLM is an isosceles trapezoid. Who knows? I could assign this to my students. Not this year. KL is parallel to JM. And JK is congruent to LM. See, it's one of those things also. I, I mean, this is a part that I could have stated for myself based on the diagram. But they're they're giving you more information, I guess. I mean, now prove that JL, prove that JL is congruent to KM. Now, this is just gonna be a triangle, you know, congruence thing. I just need to state here that we have the um, the base angles thing once again. Like, hey, this is congruent to that. This is congruent to itself there, and then we'll have the triangles congruent CPC. I, I think this is no different from what we were doing before. It's different letters, but I have to do the converse. So angle KJM is congruent to angle LMJ. 
by the base angles. Uh, not base angles congruence theorem, but uh, base angles of isosceles triangle uh, trapezoid are congruent. So, what's today, Monday? So, um, is today Monday? I'm sorry, I was thinking of something else. <laughs> I have to think of something else entirely. Um, did a JM is congruent to itself by the reflexive property? So those two triangles are congruent here, uh, KJM and triangle LMJ. This would be side angle side. Oh, yeah, I so I never used the diagonal thing before. I don't think I could have. So JL congruence came by CPCGC. I was going to use it before on another proof, but we hadn't even explored it yet. So, and, I, and I'm quite surprised that there weren't any questions involving these really at all before with the diagonals. They, they made the statement and we didn't do anything with them. Unless number 52 does it, we never used them really. So there is part A. Now part B, we have to write the other part of the thing as a conditional, then prove the statement is true. So they said, um, so the biconditional statement says, if it's an isosceles trapezoid, the diagonals are congruent. Uh, so write the other part as a conditional, then prove the statement. I think they're saying as it's a biconditional. Let me um, let me think about it. So I, I believe it's the diagonals are congruent if and only if it's an isosceles trapezoid. So the diagonals of a trapezoid are congruent if and only if it is isosceles. So this next statement here would be if the diagonals of a trapezoid are congruent, then it is isosceles. So now we have to prove that the trapezoid is isosceles knowing the diagonals are congruent, but knowing that it's a trapezoid. So the givens I can use are the congruent diagonals and the parallel lines thing, like knowing it's a trapezoid. So statements and reasons here for part B. So here's that, here's that statement. So statements and reasons. So now one, I believe I can say JKLM is a trapezoid. And I can now go off of KL still parallel to JM. But this time, we're going to say JL is congruent to JL to MK. So this is these are the parts that we now know right there. So I'm going to kind of highlight them in green like that and kind of even smudge them up so we know what we're talking about for congruence. Otherwise, it's hard to tell what I'm referring to. Uh, we don't know that these parts are congruent anymore. So we don't know those parts. But we can say now with the parallel parts, we can still say the, ooh, I can't use the base angles part anymore. I can use congruent reflexive property. The parallel parts can tell me that maybe I can prove other triangles congruent that way. Let me think about that one. This one's a little tougher to think about. Um, I wouldn't have enough information because that's only side side. I can't use this congruent to that. I can't say it's an isosceles trapezoid anymore. In fact, I want to kind of redraw this. I don't really have room, but let's see. What I could do instead, I could do, 
I did altitudes here, I could make little right triangles. Like, like what I'm thinking of is drawing something down here and making a right triangle bit. That height would be the same as this height. I wonder if there's a way for me to say that those heights are the same based on it being a trapezoid. Those heights would be the same. Um, kind of works for me, but... Well, it would have to be because it, because it would be a rectangle. It would, it would be a rectangle if I drew altitudes there. So, okay, yeah, let's do that. I'm going to redraw. I don't know where to do it. Let me just kind of blank this out. JKLM it's a trapezoid J K L M okay so this time we know these are congruent here I'll kind of I'll kind of still do a congruent mark instead of the big guys I'll just do like boom and Boom. We should know we're talking about the whole thing now. And parallel. Okay. The reason why I want to do the rectangle, I mean the altitudes, is to make a rectangle. So like, if I did something like, draw an altitude here, and an altitude here, then I've made a rectangle, and the rectangles can then tell me parts that are congruent here, and right angles. I kind of want to do an HL thing. I want to say that that triangle is congruent to that triangle by HL. Whoops. That triangle is congruent to that triangle by HL. I would have these heights the same. So I got to give letters to these though. J, K, L, M, N, and P. N and P. So I'm going to draw there. Let's see if this works. Cause I, I can't think of how to work this out otherwise. Draw KN perpendicular to JM. Oh, JN and LP perpendicular to JM by construction. Um, I'm just going to straight up call it a rectangle now uh, from the parallel parts and stuff if you drew altitudes. So KLPN is a rectangle. I know that because with the parallel parts there and these right angles, it's just now I have all right angles here. I don't know. I'm just going to need a definition of rectangle. I'm, honestly, I'm over it. <laughs> Uh, the only reason why I'm saying definition of rectangle is that now I want to say that KN is congruent to LP. Basically, they're also the heights of a trapezoid. I, I think that's also something I could say. Heights of a trapezoid are congruent, but I'll just say opposite sides of rectangle are congruent. But heights of a trapezoid are also congruent. Maybe I could have said that and that would have been fine. So now that I have these guys congruent here, and I have right angles there. Then I have HL, the hypotenuse is congruent, the diagonals. So I'm showing that this triangle is congruent to this triangle. Whoops. It's congruent to this triangle here. So I can call that triangle KNP is congruent to triangle LPJ. by HL congruence. And the reason I did that was now I can, I can't say the full angles are congruent, but at least I can say these parts are congruent. I can now say that's congruent to that by CPCTC. LJP, let's see, um, angle LJP congruent to angle, what is that? KMN, KMN, by C, P, C, T, C. So if those are congruent, 
now I can prove another two sets of triangles are congruent. Now I can say JM's congruent to itself. So I'm going to kind of erase everything that I don't need anymore. Like, hold on. I'm just going to kind of not fully restart here, but I want to get rid of stuff that I don't need. I still need my other letters there. So I think I'm done with the right angle parts. I just needed to get those angles congruent. I couldn't before without knowing it's an isosceles triangle. But in getting rid of these, I now know these two are congruent here. I already know the hypotenuse, not the hypotenuse, it's the uh, diagonals are congruent there. And now I want to show JM's congruent to itself by the reflexive property. Now I have these two triangles are congruent, which is the important ones, because I need to show that LM is congruent to, like, I need to show that it's isosceles. I need to show that that one now is congruent to this guy here. Now I'm going to have side angle side. So now, that took a little bit of work. I'm sure there was another way I could have done that. So triangle KMJ. KMJ is congruent to triangle KMJ LJM by side angle side. I got two more steps. I need CPCTC and then it's isosceles. So now by CPCTC, this, what did I do with red? I messed up on the red triangle. This, this should be the red triangle here. So this KJ is congruent to LM by CPCTC. I'll say JK. JK congruent to ML by C, P, C, T, C, and now K, L, M, J is isosceles trapezoid by definition. Ah, oh, I cannot write. I'm trying to write so fast here because I feel like I'm at the end, but I've been at the end for so long. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it's like, I love doing the review ones because there's so few proofs. All right, I think that was good enough. And finally, number 52. What special type of quadrilateral is EFGH? Write a proof to show your answer's correct. Interesting that they don't tell us kind of what to do off of it. But they say, they ask us what kind it is. So 52, in the three-dimensional figure, JK is congruent to... L, M, E, F, G, and H are the midpoints of J, L, K, L, K, M, and J, M, respectively. Where do they come up with this problem? So this is a this is what's called a triangular pyramid, and it's got interesting properties to them in what's congruent there. I don't even know where to begin with this. Um, if we have midpoints... Then we have mid segments of a bunch of triangles. Okay. I'm thinking of this in some other terms here. If these are midpoints of these, I, I, I'm going to plan this without actually doing it yet. Let me draw out kind of what, we, what we're looking at and then see if I can do something off of that. So... Let's draw a bunch of like mid-segment like things here. I'm going to copy and paste a bunch and show you what I got and what we can mark congruent and parallel and stuff. Because there are four, one, two, three, four triangles about. One, two, three. Ugh. Move, please. And four. Okay, so this left-facing triangle, I have K. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to put L on top. I have L, J, K with E. Wait, L, J, here's E, here's F. Means these two would be parallel here. So what I'm marking are these two parallel there. And this KJ is also congruent to another one, which we'll get here on the right-facing one. L 
and m with k on top here and these two are congruent boom boom obviously these two are parallel but that is f and g they don't show anything else congruent though so those are parallel in their own right and so on and so forth right all i'm all i'm trying to look toward now is like honestly i don't want to do a two column proof so i'm just kind of building off of what i can see there with that so if something's half the length of something else and those two are congruent that means those two are the same length if those two are the same length f and g this might be a kite oh and that's half the length of this oh okay hold on a second then here check this out if this was say 2x just for the sake of argument if these were 2x's actually you know what here let here let's just keep going let's keep going my proof is going to be just in my construction i hope that's okay lm and j this is the bottom triangle and i got e h and that's congruent to all those other things so let's call that another 2x there this isn't about things being parallel by the way this is about things being half the lengths so i think i can ignore the parallel parts actually no that's not true things that are parallel to oh i don't think that's true i think those are parallel to each other as well i think that's a transitive property of parallel lines i think i can use that anyway these are all x's here x x x I want to put 2x to make those things x's there. And then the other triangle that I have with the mid segment, so that was the bottom one that I did. Now there's the back one, this back triangle. But look at m as the top. m is the top. And I have j and k on the bottom, which have a congruent segment there. And again, the 2x next to j is h and g is on the other side h and then that's also an x as well so x there all those sides are the same length that would make it in essence a rhombus opposite sets of sides would be parallel to each other as well the only question is is this possibly a square and that's the thing i don't know that i can state i suppose What's something that could make me indicate this is a square and not just a rhombus? I This is for sure a rhombus, but can I say that it's a square? That's the only other... I don't think I have enough information to show it's a rhombus. Yes, I know they want me to do a whole two-column proof, but I'm just doing the mid-segment parts. I'm just joining parts up. It's not only the half length things, it's also just the parallel lines part. Opposite sides are parallel, definitely parallelogram, but those are all the same length because they share those parts. I'm just going to say EFGH is a rhombus. All sides equal. I know generally I do a two column proof. That would be a very long proof, guys, or at least long enough, especially if I'm gonna write everything out. Everything here though is triangle mid segment theorem, things being half the lengths of others, and by the drawings, they are all congruent parts. You can see that JK was used twice here, and HG and FE are both mid segments of JK if you look at the diagram the right way. Then LM is used twice here, and then F, G, and E, H are mid-segments of those ones there, which will be the same length. And those parts are congruent to each other, J, K, and L, M. So by transitive property of equality, those parts would be equal as well. So this is a rhombus there. There might be a way to indicate it's a square. I don't see what that is. I'm not going off of diagonals. Those won't work itself out. Maybe it is a square, but I don't think there's enough information there for it to be a square. And I think that'll be it for me there. 
All right, guys. Yeah, as I said, that ought to do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching. Listen, if you want to find out some more stuff, check out the playlist of I Am 2 all down below for the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 2 textbook. And see you in the future when we start doing things on the Chapter 7 review as an overall and the Chapter 7 test and cumulative assessment. So thank you so much for watching. Take care, and I will see you in the next one.